Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Nick Timoreos. Nick is a chief economics correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and joins us today to discuss his new book titled Trillion Dollar Triage, How Jay Powell and the Fed Battled a President and a Pandemic and Prevented Economic Disaster. Nick, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, David. Pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you on. And for listeners who did not get your first visit to the show, we encourage you to go back. We'll provide links to that. But as much as Nick knows about the Fed, he also knows a lot about the housing industry and GSCs. And I've always thought Nick should write a book on that as well. But Nick had a great discussion several years back on the GSCs and what happened in the Great Recession. So check that episode out as well. But today we're excited to have Nick on to talk about his new book. And of course, Nick is the individual at the Wall Street Journal who follows the Fed closely here, the Board of Governors in D.C. He's based out of D.C., And Nick, before we get into this book, which was a great read, I was dying to ask you first, what motivated you to do this? I mean, you have a full-time job as it is. You're very busy. What motivated you to do it? And secondly, how did you find time to do it on top of everything else you're doing? Yeah, no, that's a good question. The pandemic was crazy. It was a crazy time for everybody, right? And there was a lot happening. There was also a lot that didn't happen. It's hard to sort of know what the counterfactual is for if the Fed hadn't responded as aggressively as it did if Congress hadn't stepped in as quickly as it did in March 2020. And so as we got a couple of months away from March 2020, I began talking to people saying, hey, wait a minute, this seems like a major historical event has gone down. The Fed has played a surprisingly large role. And this Powell figure is somebody who no one really knows that much about unless you follow the Fed day to day you know, you're just kind of the average guy on the street may not know who this Powell guy is. And he's got a really interesting biography. He's not a PhD economist. As people who follow the Fed closely, it's the first thing they always say about him after they say that he's the Fed chair. But he had a pretty interesting road to the Fed. And then, you know, he happened to be the guy in the hot seat when all of these things happened. And I just thought, maybe there's a book there. So how did I find the time to do it? The Wall Street Journal which has been my professional home for almost 16 years now, they were great. They let me take some leave because I wouldn't have been able to get this book done as quickly as I did, or even at all, if I had had to do my two jobs at the same time. So I I took a leave from the journal for the first half, most of the first half of 2021, which was when I wrote most of this book. Okay. It was interesting reading your book because you obviously did a lot of interviews, a lot of material and background as well, but just... The amount of research you had to do to get this all together was definitely a lot of work. As you read the book, you see that. So let's move to Jay Powell. And I want to spend a lot of time on the show talking about his life. So we'll get to the pandemic and some of the interesting developments near the end of the show. But up front, I want to really flesh out who this person is, Jay Powell. We talk about him a lot on the show. And the background he provided in the book is so rich and interesting. So so walk us through his early life growing up in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Sure. So Jay Powell's the son of a lawyer. He goes on to become a lawyer. He's born in Chevy Chase, which today is a very affluent suburb of Washington, D.C. And it was fairly affluent, you know, in the 60s and 70s when he was coming of age. He goes to Georgetown Prep, which is a Jesuit school here in Washington. You may be familiar with other Georgetown Prep alums like Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh who were two of President Trump's appointees to the Supreme Court. Powell is classmates with RFK Jr., and this was tragically when Bobby Kennedy was running for president. So, you know, he grows up in sort of this very rarefied Washington world, and so some of the circumstances he finds himself in later in his career, including when he is working for Nick Brady, who's the Secretary of the Treasury, you could say those things may become naturally to some people more than others. But Powell was born in D.C., is really a creature of Washington, knows the city well. He starts his career in law. But as I mentioned, he goes into investment banking and finance. He works at Nick Brady's firm on Wall Street. 
And then when Brady comes to Washington, initially for Ronald Reagan, but really to serve as the Treasury Secretary for George Bush, who's someone that Brady knows well, Powell's sort of interested in coming down to Washington. And I write in the book about how Brady had made an agreement with Bush that he wasn't going to bring everybody from Dillon Reed, which was his firm, down to D.C., but Powell eventually convinces Brady to give him a job, and so he's an assistant secretary of finance at the Treasury, and then he becomes the undersecretary for domestic finance when his boss departs. And so, you know, this is somebody who's comfortable in these settings in Washington. So it pays to be connected and have that network set up long before you get into the game. So that's a great point. Let me go back to his earlier days. So you mentioned he went to Georgetown Prep, then he went to Princeton, and he graduated in 1975, you note in the book. And one of the little stories you bring out is really fascinating. In the summer of 1975, he travels through Europe performing like at Paris cafes and other places, Hank William ballads. So that was shocking to me. It was, it was fascinating. He's playing country music over in Europe, and the Europeans must be receptive to it because he was obviously doing it. So any more you can share about that? Yeah, so Alan Greenspan had his saxophone phone and Jay Powell has his guitar. Powell, you know, even describes himself, I think, as something of a late bloomer. So he takes this trip through Europe with a friend after college. He's still figuring out what he wants to do. Of course, you know, Georgetown Prep and Princeton, that's the elite of the elite. But Powell, you know, he's got these friends who are going into high power jobs and he hasn't really figured out what he wants to do. And so I have that anecdote about he takes his guitar with him through Europe and he finds himself entertaining the crowds at Parisian cafes. He does come back to D.C. and he decides to follow in his dad's footsteps again. He goes to Georgetown Law and he becomes editor of the Georgetown Law Review. And it's at that point where it seems like he really does begin to sort of find his stride again that he figures out what he's going to do. And then, you know, we kind of come back to this a little bit later in his career. So he goes after the Bush administration ends. Bush is effectively fired in 1992. And so Powell goes back to the private sector. He goes to one firm, doesn't stay there very long. They have a trading scandal. And so he ends up back at Dillon Reed. Then he jumps to the Carlyle Group, which is a private equity firm started by another former government policymaker, David Rubenstein, who had worked for Jimmy Carter. And, you know, Powell's initially, he has some successes at Carlisle. People have talked about Rex Nerd Corp, which is a company, a private equity deal that he had done that was fairly successful. But he isn't as successful as other people at Carlisle. And so he actually leaves. He seems somewhat frustrated. You know, it just isn't the right fit. He's done pretty well. So he's made some money, made quite a bit of money. But in 2005, he leaves Carlisle, and then he spends a couple of years in the wilderness. So we kind of come back to this idea from earlier in his career where he's still figuring out, well, what is it that I'm going to do? You know, 52 years old when he leaves Carlisle, too early really to retire. But he has a couple of business ventures that never really go much beyond a business card. And then the financial crisis hits, and he decides, you know what, maybe I'll do public service again. But in Washington, it isn't really as if there's a place where you sign up for, hey, I want to be a Fed governor, especially when you're a Republican, right. which Powell is, and the president, Barack Obama, is a Democrat. So in 2010, he finds himself in a position of, well, what, what am I going to do here? And he ends up going to work as an unpaid advisor to a think tank called the Bipartisan Policy Center, which is a centrist outfit. Yeah, so he had this love of public service that you're alluding to here. I mean, he's finding his way, but you mentioned early on he had this yearning in his heart that he wanted to do something meaningful, give to the world. And, and you gave this other story how when he was back at the Brady's firm in, in New York that he said at a meeting he wanted to do something related to public service if an opportunity ever came up. And all the partners rolled their eyes like, uh, you know, we're here to make money. We're not here to change the world, you know. But nonetheless, Nicholas Brady, he heard that and he took him with him to D.C. when he became Treasury Secretary. And another little interesting story you bring out is he hires Randy Quarles as an assistant early on. And I knew that part. But then you mentioned later in the book that he actually suggested Randy Quarles to Mnuchin, Stephen Mnuchin, for the vice chair for supervision role at the Fed. So Jay Powell was pivotal in bringing, you know, Randy Quarles both times in. So fascinating stuff. But just going back to this point, he wanted to serve. He wanted to give back. And so he kind of kept 
finding himself circling back to public institutions, to think tanks, to government initially. You also highlight that he had some practical experience that I think that proved useful later in you know 2020. He dealt with several bank failures. One you mentioned, he dealt with the Bank of New England in 1991, but then also the Solomon Brothers scandal, which was a fascinating story. I hadn't heard that he worked with and negotiated with Warren Buffett to take over. This was a primary dealer that had cornered the market on two-year treasury, and it was quite a scandal. And so he's gotten his hands dirty before, right? So he has some experience coming in to the Fed. Is that fair? Yeah. I'm not trying to suggest that what he dealt with in 91 was anything like what the Fed had to deal with in 2008. But it was sort of, you know, at the time, this was the kind of 1.0 version of too big to fail, right? Solomon was, you know, one of the biggest swashbuckling bond dealers. They were, you know, troubled by scandal. And Powell ends up being the guy who over a weekend in August of 1991 is really deputized by Nick Brady to go clean this up. And Powell talks about how Brady's kind of the guy where once he trusts you, he'll throw you in the deepest part of the ocean and let you deal with it. And there's a moment that weekend where Powell's dealing with Jerry Corrigan, who's the president of the New York Fed, and Corrigan wants Powell to report back before they sign off on anything. And Brady sort of overrules Corrigan and says, I trust Jay, you know, he's going to fix it. And he and Buffett sort of figure out the terms during this very tense Sunday afternoon where they're trying to make sure Buffett is going to be the chairman of Solomon before the markets open in Japan. Yeah, so you give a nice telling of a congressional hearing where Jay Powell has to go before them and kind of give an account of what happened. Why did this scandal emerge in the first place? And we'll come back to this point in a minute, but one of the key things about Powell is he's very disarming his personality. He has kind of an aw shucks, but yet smartness to him. And you see this back in a hearing in 1991, and you have some great quotes. I'm going to read briefly here from page 17 in your book, starting here near the middle of the page. It says, when a skeptical congressman from Kansas asked him why Treasury hadn't detected Solomon's false bids earlier, Powell raised his eyebrows and lifted his head. Quote, the fact is we did catch it, and that's why we're sitting here, said Powell. Another representative from Ohio piled on. Hadn't the Treasury simply gotten lucky because Solomon's behavior grew too sloppy? Quote, they fumbled the ball, the congressman said. You recovered the fumble. Powell held his ground. Quote, but why did they fumble? They were hit. They didn't fumble in an open field. You put his reply, Drew laughs. So it kind of disarmed the group. You know, he had a nice kind of way to come back. So he handled those hearings. And you see that today, I think, when he's before Congress. So it's, it's a nice and fascinating glimpse back to his early public service career that we see echoed today. And I, and I think he's accomplished a lot, we'll talk about it in a bit, and due in part to this personality, this political smartness that he has. All right, so let's, let's go back to where he left off in terms of his career. So he's appointed by President Obama as a governor, and you highlight this role he plays as part of the Three Amigos. So talk us about Three Amigos during this period before he's the chair, but while he's a governor. Yeah, I will. One thing before that, though, I mean, I think it's also to the point you raised about kind of where he finds himself in Washington. He gets back, he gets this governor job, basically, because he's the Republican who tells the Republicans during the debt limit standoff Mm. that their strategy is just terrible. And he says, you know, you can't take the national credit rating hostage here. They're threatening to default on the debt. And so that's actually, you know, he sort of arrives on the scene as this teller of hard truths, right? And so now he's at the Fed. He gets on the board in 2012. And you're right. He's one of the three amigos, which is one of the three governors who is reluctant about expectations that are building in the markets that the Fed's open-ended asset purchase program, QE3, is running on for longer than he had thought it was going to. So he and Jeremy Stein, who's one of the three amigos, they go to see Bernanke when QE3 starts, and they have an idea. They're talking about a $500 or $700 billion asset purchase program. This is $85 billion a month when it's at its full speed. So that implies, you know, six, seven, eight months. But Wall Street, maybe by the beginning of 2013, four months into this, is now throwing out terms like QEfinity, you know, QEternity, that the Fed is just going to be purchasing assets for uh, much longer than Powell or Stein had been anticipating. 
And I wasn't able to get all of this into the book, but if people are interested, they should go read the December 2012 meeting transcripts because many of the arguments that Powell is making where he is concerned about asset purchases would be arguments that people would have been making opposite Powell in 2021 or even in 2020. Powell is concerned about you know, the unanticipated consequences of asset purchases, everything from, you know, you're going to run losses on these if we have to raise interest rates a lot, that you're going to run a loss on the system open market account holdings. And so that's kind of interesting because those are not views that Powell holds to beyond, you know, 2013, 2014. He comes to see asset purchases as an important part of the Fed's toolkit. And so the three amigos, Betsy Duke is the third They go to see Bernanke in May of 2013, and they say, look, we need a stopping rule. You need to find an off-ramp, Chairman Bernanke, to these asset purchases. We've got to tell the markets that this isn't going to go on forever. So Powell, I think, in no small part, maybe blames himself for the taper tantrum because it is after that meeting in May. It's really after the minutes to the May meeting come out where Bernanke's testifying on the Hill And he says, you know, we might end the asset purchases at some point in the next, I don't know, couple of quarters or a few months. I don't remember exactly what the time frame was. But the market has this very visceral reaction to that. You see long-term treasury yields rise substantially. There's a violent rush of cash out of the emerging markets. And it was an unpleasant development because Powell actually at that May meeting where he's saying we should find an off-ramp, he's saying this can be done in a way that doesn't provoke some market upheaval. And then he is, you know, traumatized would be an exaggeration. But he's singed. He sees this reaction. He says, oh, my goodness. And Bernanke sort of comforts him at one point and says, don't worry, you weren't here for 2008. This is nothing. (laughs) I wonder if that singeing, that lesson carried with him to 2020. In the back of his mind, he was thinking, I don't want to repeat that mistake. Or even now, moving forward. Yeah. I think probably so. I mean, one of the critiques you could make of Fed policy in 2021 was that they were very inertial because they were trying to avoid a rerun of the taper tantrum. And I'm jumping ahead here, Mm. but, you know, at the January 2021 FOMC meeting or right before it, Powell lays down the law. There are a couple of Fed presidents talking about tapering, and they've just laid out their principles for asset purchases. They've said at their December 2020 meeting, we're going to have substantial further progress. We'll, we'll do this until, you know, $120 billion a month until we have substantial further progress. There are a couple of Fed presidents out there saying, well, maybe we can taper soon. And Powell tells them to shut up. You know, talking about tapering is tapering, he says. And so, yes, I definitely think there's something to that, David, that, you know, you don't want to make the same mistakes twice. And so they were very motivated last year not to repeat the mistakes they thought they had made after the 2009-12 stimulus episodes. That's an interesting back history that I really didn't appreciate, that Powell had a role in the 2013 taper tantrum. All right, so that brings us through 2017, and there's other things going on as well, but kind of the highlights leads us up to President Trump having to pick a new Fed chair for 2018. So the process takes place 2017, and we know Powell, of course, is appointed in February 2018. But let's go through the list of candidates, and you go through them in your book, that Trump had a look at and took seriously. So Janet Yellen, John Taylor, Kevin Walsh, and finally Jay Powell. So let's start with Janet Yellen. What did President Trump think about her, and what ultimately kept her from getting reappointed? Yeah, that's a great question, David. So Donald Trump has this interesting, I won't call it a relationship with Yellen, because they only met twice for relatively short in-person meetings. But there's a very interesting dynamic between Trump and Yellen because, first of all, you have to remember, Trump says a bunch of mean things about her when he's running for president in the fall of 2016. He says she's keeping rates low to help Obama and to help Hillary Clinton, that she's so political. You know, there's a big fat bubble. And Trump doesn't really believe any of those things. He just, you know, he wants interest rates to be low if he's president, but if he's not president, then he wants, you know, a a different set of economic policies. And there's even an ad that the Trump campaign runs. Some people thought it had anti-Semitic overtones. It flashes a picture of, you know, the global power brokers, George Soros and Lloyd Blankfein, who's then the CEO of Goldman Sachs and Janet Yellen. 
So that wasn't a happy moment for the Fed to be drawn into sort of this political scrum. But then once he's president, he seems to really respect Janet Yellen as someone who knows what she's doing, who the markets respect. There's an element of appearances, physical appearances mattering enormously to Donald Trump. So as an example, when Randy Quarles comes in to interview for the vice chair supervision in the spring of 2017, there's some concern among Trump's advisors about how this meeting is going to go because they've finally settled on Quarles as the pick after other people being in the process. You remember Trump, he didn't have a, a normal kind of vertical process for personnel. So there's always a chance that someone's going to get derailed from the side. And Quarles walks into the room for this meeting and Trump says, well, boy, doesn't he look the part? And Trump's mm -hmm. advisors at that point sort of breathe a sigh of relief. If you've met Randy Quarles, you know, he has this very patrician bearing, you know, sort of the, the square jaw yep. and the three-piece suit. He does look the part. I mean, I don't even know what a central banker is supposed to look like, but Randy Quarles looks like that person, right? Especially if yes, you're Donald Trump indeed. and appearances matter. So. There's another episode, which was first reported by the Washington Post, but I have it in the book as well, where Trump is meeting with an advisor. This is not a meeting on anything to do with financial policy. It's on tech or energy or something completely unrelated. And the advisor's never been in to brief Trump before and sits down on the couch. And the first thing Donald Trump says to this advisor is, so do you think Janet Yellen is tall enough to be Fed chair? You know, well, yeah, she's already been the Fed chair at that point for three and three quarter right. years, but she is a small person. She's five feet tall. And so the other, I think, point I should make about Yellen is that Trump's staff is very skeptical of keeping her, even though there's this tradition through several decades now of reappointing, even if it's the president of the other party, there's a lot of concern Remember, in 2017, Trump is trying to get his tax cuts through the Senate. They were not able to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And, you know, today I think people take for granted that the Senate Republicans would do whatever Donald Trump wanted. But at this point in time, that wasn't necessarily the prevailing wisdom. And so there's a concern that, gee, he's going to blow it with the Senate Republicans if he keeps yelling. She gives a speech at Jackson Hole in August of 2017 that is – pretty much a full-throated defense of the Dodd-Frank reforms. And this is when Trump and some of his advisors are talking about, quote-unquote, doing a number on Dodd-Frank. Stan Fisher, who's the vice chair, goes and gives an interview with the FT, blasting the Trump administration for some of the things they want to do on deregulation. And so Trump's advisors are able to take these things to him and say, see, she's really not on the team. You need to find somebody else. So there's a short list of other candidates and Powell's on the short list, but it's not clear at first that he would be the pick because he is sort of seen both within the White House and by Senate Republicans as a Janet Yellen light, a Republican version of Janet Yellen. Yeah, that was a big takeaway I got from your book is that the ultimate reason Janet Yellen did not get picked was politics. His staff was worried the Republican senators would say no. And they wanted to get other things done. So I hadn't recognized that. So that was interesting to, to see that. It wasn't so much her appearance. I mean, this came up, her appearance, and that's kind of what I had in my mind. She wasn't tall enough. But what was more important was the politics going on behind the scene. Okay, let's talk about John Taylor. So John Taylor, I mean, I remember he was supposed to be Fed chair under President George W. Bush, and Bernanke caught it. It's his chance again with President Trump. So why didn't he make the cut? Well, so John Taylor is the namesake of the Taylor rule, right? The the guide for how you set rates. And at the time, you know, the Taylor rule had said interest rates should be significantly higher than they were. I don't have at hand, you know, it was a 3% or 3.5% interest rates at the time are, you know, the Fed's just getting them up to 1% through 2017 when this is all happening. And so that's perhaps if you're Donald Trump and you have a lot of debt on your real estate businesses, I mean, Donald Trump, probably more than any president we've ever had, knows what a 25 basis point increase in the cost of money means for a business. He does not want interest rates to go up. And here's a guy who's been saying, you know, all of these monetary experiments, QE and, and all this stuff, we shouldn't be doing this. And Taylor actually gives a speech right as this process is nearing the apex, where he sort of backs off from the Taylor rule, have to stick hard and fast to this. There are people in the White House who 
uh, including in vice president's office, who are really pushing Taylor. Taylor also has maybe some challenges because the rap on him when he was at the Treasury Department in the Bush administration was that he wasn't the best manager. And so there are some people saying, maybe, you know, you want someone who doesn't have that baggage. Okay, so John Taylor does not make the cut. And then the other big contender, the almost contender, was Kevin Warsh. So you tell a fascinating story about him. I mean, even in the early 2000s, you mentioned he campaigned hard for a Treasury job that Randy Quarles ultimately got. And I actually worked at Treasury, Nick, under Randy Coral. So I got to know him there. And so it's fascinating to read this backstory to how he got that job. And I didn't realize Kevin Warsh wanted it so bad. And, and you mentioned in the book, he actually created some enemies. He had lots of connections. He's well networked, but he also, you know, irritated people. He was so ambitious that you mentioned George Bush had to step in. But, but let's talk about the Fed chair appointment. That's back in their other stories back in the early 2000s. Let's talk about getting the Fed appointment. What was his case and why didn't he make it? So Powell and Warsh are the first two people who are invited to interview with Donald Trump. It's at the end of September. They're on back-to-back -back days. And Powell's interview goes quite well. Warsh's interview, I've heard differing accounts of how that went. But, you know, Warsh had been a loyal ally of Ben Bernanke through most of the early period of the crisis. And then they split over QE2. And after 2010, and Warsh leaves, and he becomes a very harsh critic of the Fed's unconventional monetary policies. And Warsh is seen as somebody that maybe would be Fed chair if Mitt Romney had been elected president in 2012. And he continues to write op-eds that are very critical of what the Fed is doing through this period. He said the Fed needs new strategies. They've kept interest rates too low for too long. Donald Trump becomes president. And in 2017, all of a sudden, it seems like, as with Taylor, maybe having been an advocate for higher interest rates is now a liability if you want to be the Fed chair under Donald Trump. And so Warsh gives a speech at the Hoover Institutions Conference that spring of 2017, where he blasts the Fed, you know, he comes as a reformer, that they need new communications, they need better policy tactics and strategies. And so he's no longer a critic so much of the low interest rate policies. So that's implied in his broader critique. But he's now positioning himself as a reformer. He will be the one who can reform mm. the Fed. He would chaired a group that led a report studying the Bank of England, the Warsh report in 2014. So it's not as if he has no credentials on that point. And, you know, as you note, there are some people who are really big fans of his in Washington. And then there are other people who have been rubbed the wrong way, and they come out of the woodwork and tell Steven Mnuchin, who at this point is running the process. You know, we didn't talk about Gary Cohn. Gary Cohn had mm -hmm. been a candidate for the Fed chair. Trump had publicly mused early on as the two candidates were Yellen or Cohn. Then Cohn has some harsh words for Trump after the debacle at the neo-nationalist gathering in Charlottesville. And so Cohn's pretty much frozen out at that point. And Mnuchin becomes the person. Well, there are people telling Mnuchin, you don't want Warsh. And so Mnuchin, at a certain point, comes out strong for Powell. You know, maybe that's because he sees where things are going. He's also had the opportunity to get to know Powell because when Dan Tarullo resigns from the board in April of 2017, Powell becomes the point person on FINREG. So they are able to sort of develop a little bit of a rapport relationship. You know, Powell compared to Warsh, has a few more gray hairs. He's seen as somebody, perhaps by the Treasury Secretary, who's maybe the gray beards would be more comfortable with. And Trump even says to his college classmate, Ron Lauder, who is the father-in-law of Kevin Warsh, your son was great, but he's just a little too young. There you go. You have the appearances again. Yeah, that was another fascinating story you have in there, that Kevin Warsh's good looks actually came back to bite him in the rear. So I like the story you mentioned about Warsh back in 2010 when he broke with Bernanke. And I, if I remember correctly, you wrote an op-ed. He, he voted in favor of QE2 or what, what it was. And then he comes out and literally blindsided Bernanke and the rest of the governors and the Fed and really, you know, 
push them apart. So he both has people that love him, as you said, and people that aren't as excited about him. All right. So we have Powell. He gets appointed. You mentioned a few other details. So Jay Powell likes to ride bikes. So does Steven Mnuchin. So they did some bike rides together. And at the end of the day, you say that, you know, for President Trump, Jay Powell is a Republican version of Janet Yellen. So continuity, you don't rock the boat. All the other candidates have these flaws that, you know, President Trump doesn't want. So Jay Powell kind of slides in there. And it's just interesting, again, you know, someone who didn't have the ambition, wasn't lobbying for it. I think you mentioned how Steve Mnuchin liked him. I mean, I think this goes back to his disarming personality again, his his ability to get along with people and see that he can get work done. He's pragmatic. So all these things you know, life skills that were taught. He had them and he, to his advantage, he used them. All right. So let's move into then his time as Fed chair pre-pandemic. So 2018 to 2019. And you highlight that as he comes in, he wants to have several people as a part of his troy, three people who really lead the agenda. So it's the Fed chair, the New York Fed president, and then the vice chair. And this was also some news to me, but he wanted John Williams initially as the vice chair, which was interesting, but he didn't make the cut. And and you also revealed some more details about the New York Fed selection of John Williams. One of the critique has been about the regional bank presidents is how they get appointed. It's a little bit mysterious. But you actually provided a few more details I hadn't seen before. So walk us through John Williams and then ultimately Rich Clarita as well. How did they all come onto the scene? Yeah, so this is happening around the same time. The White House now is deciding who's going to be the vice chair for Powell. At the same time, Bill Dudley has announced his resignation uh, effective that summer of 2018. So there's going to be a new New York Fed president. Williams has some conversations with the White House, but he never gets to the stage where he's interviewing with Trump. And then the New York Fed campaign, the committee that decides on the New York Fed president, has narrowed down their search to three candidates. Raymond McGuire, who is an investment banker, runs investment banking for Citigroup, and then Mary Miller, who had spent her career at T. Rowe Price and then is the undersecretary for domestic finance for Tim Geithner in the first term of the Obama administration. And then John Williams is one of the finalists. And remember, there's a lot of pressure on these reserve banks to have a more diverse leadership because the reserve bank presidents at this time and really until now skew white male. And so, you know, Ray McGuire is black, one of the most prominent African-Americans on Wall Street. And Mary Miller, of course, is a woman. But there is a concern. The the search comes down to McGuire versus Williams. And there is a concern within the Fed And the Fed board has to sign off on the pick. And there is a concern that, look, you know, this bank, City took TARP money, you know, less than 10 years ago. And the system has been very proactive in making sure that they're minimizing these potential conflicts where they have people from, you know, TARP recipients coming to work inside the the system. And so that ends up really making it almost impossible for the New York Fed board to pick Ray McGuire. And so... John Williams, who at the time is the president of the San Francisco Fed, ends up getting selected by that committee at almost the exact same time that's happening. Trump is deciding who to choose as the vice chair of the board. And Rich Clarida ends up being the person who I think Powell is the most comfortable with. There were a couple other people who had been campaigning for the job. Larry Lindsay, who had been a Fed governor in the 90s and top economic advisor to George W. Bush, and then Mohamed el Arian, who had also worked at PIMCO with Rich Clarida. But, you know, Clarida ends up being the person Powell is the most comfortable with. And at this point, Trump has not turned on Powell. So when they talk, and I'm not sure how much they were actually talking, but, you know, Powell makes clear that Rich is the guy he wants. And when Rich interviews with Donald Trump, it's sort of bizarre. At one point, Trump asks him, well, what do you think of Muhammad al Arian? Some people are talking about him. And Rich sort of awkwardly says, well, he used to be my boss. And then Trump interrupts and says, well, Jay likes you. Steve, referring to Mnuchin, likes you. So it's going to be you. Wow. What an interview process. So, you know, something else that you brought out about Rich Clarita is that he is a very talented musician. I, I knew that he had some skills already. I mean, I was familiar with his album 
time no changes, which we all looked at when he you know, was vice chair. But you mentioned he played the clarinet, the saxophone, the guitar, the piano, and he was in jazz and rock bands in high school. So you know, he could have gone down a very different career path had he pursued his music path. And you said his father was a high school music teacher. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So he's yeah. got the musical gene too. Yeah, so fascinating details in the book. Okay, so let's let's move to Jay Powell and talk more about his character. We've alluded to it. But walk us through this personality, his strong political chops, his disarming, you know, charm and how it's made a difference. Well, one of the important, I think, lessons he sort of internalizes from the blowback the Fed faces after the 2008 crisis. You had to bail out all these banks. There's a lot of unhappiness, of course that the Fed had to do all this. Parts of Congress become quite unhappy with the Fed, especially over Dodd-Frank. Republicans think that the Fed has just completely partnered with Democrats on, you know, promulgating these new financial regulations. The Fed felt like it really had no choice because if you're not in the room when these things happen, you're going to lose your your authorities. They're going to get handed off to others. So, but Powell recognizes that there's an opportunity now with a reset. You know, Bernanke and Yellen, are, even though he's very much in that mold of policymaking, they are no longer there. And so he uses that as an opportunity to sort of reset the Fed's brand, including on Capitol Hill. And, you know, one of the things about Powell is that he has a very good EQ. He's a very good listener. He has this weird trait where he can repeat back a sentence backwards, but he's listening to people. And he doesn't sort of talk above them and use these highfalutin words that sometimes central bankers use where people feel like they can not understand at all what this person is talking about. And he actually seems to enjoy it. So he does a bunch of these 30-minute meetings, 20, 30-minute meetings up on the Hill, meeting with lawmakers. I want to hear what matters to you, and I'm going to tell you what we're doing. And people like that, and people seem to like him. And so he uses maybe we'll call it his honeymoon period at the Fed to really begin to get to know the boss, which is Congress and the 535 lawmakers who could, you know, make life difficult for the Fed if they want to. And I don't know how much he saw the fight coming with Trump, Trump trying to bully the Fed into providing easier policy. I would imagine that Powell recognized this was not going to be some sort of easy rodeo. I don't know if that's why he took on these meetings, but it certainly didn't hurt to have people who knew that you weren't whatever the caricature was going to be in the tweet or in the president's own version of events. Yes, and you mentioned that one of the Fed staffers called him the Jimmy Stewart of monetary policy. So I love that. It it is. It's an aw shucks kind of guy, but yet he's effective at doing his job. And the other famous quote of his you mentioned in the book that is, he said that he would wear out the carpets on Capitol Hill. He would make so many visits that his mark would be left there. So very well thought out. He was very intentional about doing this. So I think, you know, we, we see the success in, in that honeymoon stage. But I think a lot of the things that's happened since then, I think we can also chalk up to this effort, this high EQ, this intentionality that he had, including, you know, ushering through the, the framework change. I mean, changing how the Fed does monetary policy going from, you know, flexible inflation targeting to flexible average inflation targeting. That's a huge change. And not anybody could just usher that through. But someone like Powell, I think, probably helped navigate it through. I mean, the operations, you know, formally adopting the ample reserve system, and then finally, you know, just navigating through the pandemic. It's great to have somebody who can speak to both sides of the aisle, someone who's a mediator. I just think Powell was the perfect person for this time. And his personality played a big role in that. Okay, let's let's move then to the attacks that you just alluded to. And something I learned from your book, I guess I didn't appreciate or know before, is that Trump really didn't start his attacks on the Fed until after the trade war was really put into play. And the trade war was not put into play until after the tax cuts 2017 were made. So Trump, he didn't want to burn any political capital. So you know the tax cuts by the end of 2017, they're passed. And then he's like, okay, the gloves are coming off. We're going to go full speed ahead on the trade war. And then the trade war creates uncertainty. It affects the stock market. And the Fed's tightening at the same time in 2018. And so that sets the stage for the attacks, is that trade war is going on. So it's interesting how you put the pieces of the puzzle together. I'm wondering, Nick, do you think Trump would have attacked Powell anyway? So let's say there's no trade war. But you mentioned in the, your book 
you know, Trump loved low rates, right? And in fact, he even pushed for negative rates. He, he harassed Powell. Why can't we have negative rates like Germany and Europe? So let's say there were no trade war, which was the pivotal catalyst here in him attacking the Fed, creating the environment to attack the Fed. Do you think he still would have gone after the Fed and Powell, even in an environment where that wasn't going on? Gee, that's a good question. It's certainly possible, right? I mean, Trump didn't want anything that was going to threaten his stock market. You know, he loved to point to the Dow as a report card. And he talked a lot about how he wanted there to be rocket fuel in the economy, right? In 2017, when he's passing the tax cuts. And then in early 2018, people forget about this, but there was a big increase in federal spending. The sequester caps are lifted dramatically. And, you know, you have people like Larry Summers at that point talking about the economy overheating. The Fed doesn't want the economy to go up like a rocket ship. They want slow and steady, even keeled growth. So yes, it's certainly possible that without the trade war, you still get the turn of events that we had, especially if you have Fed officials talking about restrictive monetary policy, which a lot of people were talking about in 2018. I mean, people were saying, Three and a half percent unemployment, that's crazy. You're going to have to, Mm. you know, engineer an increase in the unemployment rate because that's too low. But then you do get the trade war and that sort of, you know, as I write in the book, Trump basically gets what he wants out of the Fed, not really by bullying them on Twitter, but by pursuing a trade policy that leads them to conclude that they cannot actually push interest rates above, you know, two and a half percent, which was what they had been talking about doing. Yes, and you make this point that the Fed's raising interest rates in 2018, and so Trump is running this trade war, and the trade war is creating uncertainty, you know, problems in the stock market, and so the long end of the yield curve actually drops because of what Trump is doing, whereas the Fed's pushing up to short, and so it, it took two to tango here. But it's interesting that Trump actually played a role in that curve beginning to invert. And it's an interesting kind of analogy to where we are today, right? The Fed's facing a similar predicament, an inverted yield curve. Should they take it seriously or not? And back then, they were very eager to keep pushing forward. That's a nice segue into what I want to ask about the Fed's thinking, how it evolved 28, 2019. Because we know they had a number of rate hikes in 2018, they were talking about doing more than they paused, a big change, a big pivot in early 2019. And what was interesting is I read your book and kind of thinking back on this, Jay Powell had this speech, and you, you mentioned it in your book in August of 2018, where he kind of poured cold water on navigating by the stars. He's like, let's don't rely too much. There's something there, but they're vague. They're hard to see. Let's don't rely too much on it. But by the end of the year, a few months later, he was relying on that very concept you know, to push rates up. And you mentioned he had that moment where he said rates are a long ways from neutral. They need to change it to just below neutral. But point being, in both cases, he's referring to the neutral rates. So how do I handle that tension? On one hand, he was saying, you know, we shouldn't pay too much attention to our star. On the other hand, by the end of the year, he was saying, well, we need to pay attention because we're getting close. So that last quarter of 2018 is really where his trial by fire begins. He makes this offhand comment on October 3rd, 2018, where he says, you know, we're a long way from neutral probably. And I think the important context for that is the September 2018 meeting. We won't get the transcripts for a couple more years, but there's an element of hawkishness at that meeting. I mean, you even have someone like Leo Brainerd giving a speech after that meeting saying maybe policy has to get restrictive. And so one way to read the comment, which was the way the market read it, was Powell's saying interest rates have to go up a lot more because we're a long way from neutral. The other way to read the comment, though, is Powell basically saying we're a long way from having to figure out if policy is going to have to get restrictive. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. You know, let's get to neutral first. But that comment, it's not a scripted line. It's in one of these unscripted Q&A, you know, sit on the white leather couch sort of things. And it begins to sort of take on baggage. People are amping out over it the stock market, and really the 10-year yield begin to come down. And so people are looking for a catalyst. Well, what what is it that made the market get nervous? And they can go back and look, well, on October 3rd, after the markets closed, Powell made this comment about maybe he's a hawk. And I think that's a danger that you run when you put someone in charge of the Fed who's new, is markets have to figure out what is this man or woman you know, all about. And no one at the time, knew a whole lot about how Powell was going to lead things. There was kind of this handoff from Yellen, which was to keep raising rates once a quarter by a quarter point. And so, yeah, then you get long way from neutral. And then in November, when the markets are really seizing up over this, he says, 
rates are just below, you know, a broad range of estimates of neutral. John Williams is another one, right? I mean, he's the expert on our star, and he gives a speech that fall saying, well, you know, our star isn't a specific destination. It's more of a fuzzy blur. You know, you can see that they're trying to get away from it. I think the challenge that Powell has on the committee, and this is very much the case at that December 2018 meeting, is you've got a bunch of different views around the table. So you've got Clarida, who thinks a neutral rate is at around 2.5%, which is where they are just getting with that final increase in 2018. And he says, look, if we can't get to neutral now, when are we ever going to be able to do it? But I think Clarida would have been comfortable pausing at neutral. Williams thinks neutral is at 2.5%, but that they're going to need to go to 3.5%. And you have other people on the committee who I think share that view. So even though no one can agree on where neutral is, but then also no one can agree on, you know, where the terminal rate is, which may be completely different from where your estimate of the neutral rate is. And that December 2018 meeting becomes very difficult because the rate increase is really priced in up until the last day. And then there's market turmoil, there's trade war concern, there's Trump tweeting saying, don't do this, stop with the 50 Bs. He's talking about balance sheet policy, allowing $50 billion of securities to mature every month. And so it really creates kind of a, you know, I hate the term perfect storm, but there's a perfect storm in that December 17, 2018 Fed meeting where Powell thinks that he's signaling a dovish hike and the market just says, this isn't dovish at all. What are you guys doing? Well, I do like the term perfect storm. So I think it's a great description of that time, Nick. And I like, you know, you, you brought out John Williams and Lael Brainerd because that was something that was very shocking to me at the time. Lael Brainerd, she even applied that, you know, what's the big deal of the little yield curve inversion, long as it's, you know, the path to normalcy. And then to have John Williams come out and say, ah, bah humbug, our star, you know, we don't really know where it is. And so I actually created a t-shirt back then, the Fed's motto for 28, 2019, we have the nerve to invert the curve. They seemed rather flippant at the time. You mentioned in the book, and as we know, the Fed changed their tune dramatically in January when they saw what was happening. I'm wondering if what happens you know, between December and January and subsequently later that year in 2019 is the fruition of the ideas in the August speech of Jay Powell. So Jay Powell lays out the intellectual case for not taking our star or navigating by the stars too seriously. And as you said, it's trial by fire. Maybe by January, it's actually something that they're taking to heart. Is that one interpretation? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's clear that there's, there's a year-end market reaction. Year-end is already sort of a difficult time in the markets. But that reaction to that meeting had a huge impression on the Fed and on Powell. And Clarida goes out and gives a speech in early January where he says, we have to balance the risk of the model being wrong when we set policy. And that's just not something I'm used to hearing from Fed people sort of saying, well, the models might be wrong. You know, we shouldn't set policy just based on a forecast if, you know, it looks like the economy is not performing as we think it will. So... The other thing that happens, so you talked about, you know, the nerve to invert the curve. In July of 2018, which is when twos and tens begin to flatten quite a bit, the two-year Treasury yield begins to get quite close, rise quite high to where the 10-year yield sits. And the Fed puts out this paper saying, really don't pay much attention to the 210 spread. Look at the near-term forward spread, which they take the three-month bill rate versus the implied six quarters later three-month bill rate. And that's still fairly steep. And they say that's a better indicator of Fed rate cuts. Inverted yield curves, they don't necessarily predict recessions. They predict rate cuts, which also tend to predict recessions. Well, very beginning of January, right before Powell you know, does the pivot, what happens to that near-term forward spread? It inverts. Now, I'm not saying that that at all. <laughs> they, they weren't setting policy based off of the near-term yeah. spread. But you could see in the markets, January 2nd, 2019, the market's now saying, we think the Fed's going to cut. And nobody's thinking that, you know, you still have JP Morgan and, and the macro modelers saying the Fed's going to raise rates three or four times this year. Powell pivots that first Friday in Atlanta. He says, basically, we're done. He has not consulted with the FOMC when he says that, but they're quickly on board. Everybody recognizes that there's a lot going on. And, you know, interest rates, if they're close to neutral, maybe you don't have to do anything else at that point. You know, it's a good position to be in when inflation is right below your target, different place from where the Fed is now, of course. Yeah. 
We are running low on time, so Nick, I have two questions left, and we're going to have to skip a big part of your book, which is the pandemic. So listeners, get the book, read it, great stories, great details, like we've been mentioning already. But I want to move to the more present time, and the Fed in this January meeting, it reconfirmed its existing framework, the framework they announced in August of 2020. So they recommitted themselves to the flexible average inflation targeting framework. And you know something that I think many people, including myself, did not get about this framework is the flexible part. We were focused too much on the average inflation targeting approach. And if you, if you focus just on AIT, you get the impression that it's symmetric, that if it's below, yes, we all understood the below at zero lower bound, but if it was above, it'd come back down. But it's a flexible one. And, and moreover, if you look at kind of the intellectual history, Bernanke's temporary price level target, this was always intended to do price level targeting only from below target. It was never intended to be something from above. Like, I, you know, I, again, I fell prey to this impression too. Oh, it's some kind of symmetric, maybe it's a shorter version of a price level target. But no, I think there's a lot of confusion over that. And, and just now we're beginning to figure this out. So when you look at, you know, the FOMC's summary of economic projections, you see inflation coming down to 2%. You don't see it undershooting 2% and going back up to 2 Is that something you've seen as well that a lot of people are missing, that, that fate never was like a symmetric version of a price level target? It was always an asymmetric approach. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Go read Clarita's speeches and go look at the footnotes. I mean, for Clarita, this was basically a, a way of backdooring in Ben Bernanke's temporary price level target. How do you define the temporary interval? you're re-anchoring expectations. And the Fed did that really by last June or July, right? You saw expectations come back up to where they had been before they started to slip in 2014. And so at that point, it's pretty much mission accomplished for FAIT. Now, they don't say that at the time because they've delivered this very dovish guidance in September 2020. The way they operationalized the framework was to say, you know, inflation forecast to rise above two and rates at zero until we hit max employment. And June, July, they're certainly not ready to declare max employment when we're still at a 6% unemployment rate. But we got there much faster than they anticipated. And so hence the pivot in November of 2021. Yeah. And I would also add that one of the challenges of doing a temporary price level target or any really price level target is you got to know how much of that increase is due to supply shocks versus demand shocks in real time. That's almost impossible task. Okay, last question. I'm dying to know this since you you know you have inside scoop at the board of governors. So how active is Powell in following Twitter? You actually had an article on this some time ago. But like when we say things, is he really listening to us? I mean, how engaged is he in social media, Twitter, listening to podcasts, all those things? What is your sense from interacting with the Fed? I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know. I think he's probably more present than the average person might realize. He's got a lot of other stuff to do. I think the Fed staffers I've talked to who have mentioned this sort of Twitter lurking trait to me have said, you know, he's he's looking to sort of have alternate information streams. And Twitter can provide a good one. You know, there's a comment he makes in the transcripts about this was when he's a governor, but it's very specifically a reference to a Joe Weisenthal tweet on the ECB, 4 a.m., people following what the German court is doing with the lawsuit against the ECB. And so he's lurking. I don't know how much time he has for it these days. But you, you do outline a nice thing about his personality and his, his leadership is that he is looking for other opinions. And one place he goes is to Twitter for that. But other academics, people outside the Fed as well. So, Okay, Nick, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Nick Timoreos. Nick, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me, David. It was a pleasure. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.